Hello, everyone. I'm Pauline Thornhill. Tonight on Land and Sea, a Remembrance Day special. Dave Quinton has the story of the Newfoundland community that grew out of the darkness of World War II. The community was Cormac, and her pioneers were Newfoundland servicemen and their young brides, many who'd come all the way from war-torn Europe. This is our tribute to those Cormac pioneers. Many people are surprised to discover there are places on our rocky isle where the fields are broad and green. Where the soil is rich and fruitful. Such a place is Cormac, out here in western Newfoundland. A settlement that grew out of the ashes of World War II. World War II. Our fellows were in the thick of it. They served with distinction. Six years of hell, of carnage, death and destruction. And then it was over. Our troops came home. There was much rejoicing. But it wasn't just servicemen who stepped off the ships in Halifax and St. John's. Thousands of war brides came too. Young women, our soldiers and sailors had married overseas. All eager to begin life anew in the bustling and vigorous new world. The 800 or so who arrived in Newfoundland must have suffered a bit of a culture shock though. Far from the mainstream of North American life, the old colony had just emerged from a depression. The old salt cod fishery was overcrowded and in decline, and there was virtually no industry to take its place. What would the veterans do? How could they make a living for their young families? Since the island was far from self-sufficient in foodstuffs, it seemed like a good idea to encourage some of them to become farmers. An agricultural training program for veterans was established in the demonstration farm in Mount Pearl. And over the next few years, hundreds of young soldiers, sailors and airmen graduated. No roads then. Veterans with wives and children headed out on the bullet to a new life as farmers, homesteaders in the wilderness. Each couple was given the shell of a small house and 10 acres of roughly cleared land. The rest was up to you. And so the great fields you see in Cormac today were carved from the wilderness by young veterans and their wives. Alice Hewitt was one of the war brides who came to Cormac 50 years ago from Scotland. I worked in the garden with Alec, alongside Alec. We cleared uh, rocks and that. And then when I got, the first, when I first came, the first three of my family, I, uh, I used to carry Howard up in the garden and put them on a blanket and, and go weeding with the, the potatoes or something uh, with him on a pack of ground. The baby on the blanket has grown now. Howard Hewitt and his brothers have taken over the family farm. You know, in those days, uh, you know, it had to be a family effort. My mother, you know, uh, uh, drove tractors with dad and hauled loads of turnips and, you know, and done work side by him bagging potatoes and picking up potatoes and, you know, and they had to. It was, you know, because uh, in the early years, uh, with my mother the same as other uh, 
uh, farm women here. Uh, you know, the farms couldn't afford hired labor, so it was a, it had to be a family effort in order to make, uh, you know, make a success of things. It's a peaceful place today, but Cormac was even quieter then. A real tonic for a woman who'd seen the horror and known the terror of the bombings. They couldn't imagine, you know, how noisy it could be, you know. It's awfully nice to see a plane look up the sky and see him going over, but it's not so good when you don't know if he's a friendly one or a and anyway, and that's what usually happens sometimes because when I was stationed at Mary Hill Barracks in Glasgow, we were just coming home from, I'd been visiting my aunt, and we saw this plane whipping coming, and my friend said, that, that looks like a German, and there's no lights on it, and it was. And we flew down to our house because we weren't living, we didn't live in barracks, we were billeted outside the barracks. And we never got down in this, to the house when bang. And this was the big raid they had on Glasgow that night. And there was, they said, 400 German planes over that night. And it started about 5 to 8. And it never left up until 8 the next morning. From a war to a wilderness, it was quite a change. Though the work was hard and the money scarce in those pioneer days, this land seemed to be teeming with riches for the girl from Edinburgh. We could get a lot of stuff, you know, off the land. There was rabbits and the moose. And that was something I think I really found was different. You know, because you could pick all the berries that you liked you know, and make jam and there was raspberries and blueberries. I don't think anybody would go hungry in Newfoundland if they didn't, hardly if they didn't have any money. <laughs> Newfoundland was a far different place then. Roads were few, many communities isolated. In order to enlist for overseas, young men and women in Bombay had to cross the bay ice and the mountains by dog team. Well, the That's how Bruce north. Roberts joined up and served so with the Royal Newfoundland the Artillery. We went to north he fell in love with Margaret in Norfolk, England. Yeah, where we used to court when I got on holiday. Wounded in action, Bruce was discharged early. Mm -hmm. He and his young bride dodged U-boats <laughs> as they returned from this England. Margaret was only 20 years old when she arrived in Bombay. A couple of years later, she and Bruce began to homestead in the woods of Cormac. Well, I was just happy to be here, you know, because, well, the war was horrid. And we had each other, and we were just glad to be here. And I, I could settle anywhere, really. And I just was so glad to be clear of the bombing and everything. It must have been quite a contrast yeah. to see the wilderness compared oh, with Oh, yes, mm. yes. But Bruce had told me a lot about it. I mean, I really wasn't surprised about how, how things were. The house was built, the shell, and we had just our kitchen finished with the wall board, as that was called then. And we had a range, and I had a three-month-old baby. The land was rougher and rockier than they'd expected. Some families soon gave up in despair, but Margaret and Robert clung to their dreams and watched their family grow. After fighting his way through Africa and Italy, Cormac was heaven to soldier Bruce. We just had plenty of, plenty of energy. The only thing, I was a bit handicapped then because I was partly disabled where I got so badly burnt. So, uh, you know, I was kind of limited like that. Now, Margaret says she was glad to escape the war. Were you glad, too, in a sense? Yes, I was glad. I had enough then. I seen all I wanted to see. You know. So Cormac must have looked like heaven after that. Oh, yes, pretty peaceful, yeah. Crops were slow in the early years, but gradually the soil began to yield a good harvest. And so did the woods, for the forest was full of moose. Cooking wild meat was something rather different for a girl from England. 
At one time, I had three hearts in the oven stuffed. <laughs> moose hearts. That was something uh, you hadn't seen moose all before. No, you came. and we bottled and bottled it. Mm. Yeah, because there's no fridges or anything, no refrigeration. So it was a completely different life for you. Oh women. yes, yes. But we didn't, we didn't seem to mind. We had everything we needed. Lots of, especially after we got the cows and everything, and the calves, and we had calves' liver and milk and butter, and we had our own separator, and um, used to make butter. We had hens. We had lots of eggs. We had pigs. And um, geese and ducks. Despite the lack of electricity, roads, and services, Cormac was a land of plenty compared with post war Britain. Like thousands of others, the Roberts family did their best to help the people back in the war ravaged old country. I used to send care packages home. I'd. Um, pack big packages for my parents and uh, canned salmon and butter in cans and tea and so up in canvas or a piece of cloth so that it wouldn't burst, you know, with the weight. You were allowed to send care packages. Yes. Well, Often Bruce and Margaret thumb through their albums, glancing back to those wartime years, thinking of friends who didn't return reliving the happy moments when family and friends were reunited, recalling how, as a young family, they started life anew in Cormac. Do you often think back to those days? Yes, yes. It's good that we, we had a good life. When we return, we'll continue our story of the Cormac pioneers. Farms of Cormac have changed dramatically in recent years. They're bigger, modern, progressive. You have to look hard to find reminders of those early days. Quite a few of the original settlers are gone now. Their tombstones show what a diverse group they were. from a sword to a plowshare. It was quite a transition. Take Bert Hillier, for example. He left a fishing village for the battlefields of Europe, then found himself riding a horse and cart in Cormac. When we came here first, the most we used was horse and uh, cart, or wintertime slide, horse and slide, and bikes, bicycle. It must have been strange, after driving tanks through France, and sailing battleships through the Mediterranean to be pedaling bicycles and harnessing horses in Cormac. But that's what they did, those soldier-sailor pioneers. And this is Gordon Keats, DSM. Art Taylor, he used to be here working in our co-op store. They come from all over the island. All, all across the island. All, all parts of Newfoundland that was as represented in, the, in this group as you see here. And who's this young fellow here? Oh, uh, that's Bert Hillier. <laughs> <laughs> that's the fellow that got no hair on his head right there. <laughs> and how old would you have been there? Uh, about 20. 20 years old. Yeah. We were all kids, really? Oh, we were all kids, yeah. The pioneers of Cormac. How young they look, how young they were. From all over the British Isles they came, and from all over Newfoundland. The Roberts family of Bombay, three brothers and a sister, served overseas. Of these, two settled in Cormac. Bruce, who we've already met, and his sailor boy brother, Gus. We had the first dairy farm here. We started off, we had, uh, well, we started off, we started off with the sawmill first. And we had one cow. And then we, Dad give, gave me a cow from out to Bombay. We brought in there. Her name was Penny. 
So then we got the idea, I said I'd buy some cows, so we start buying cows and starting r raising them and go on. And one day we were running the sawmill and Bibbidi Bay. And Not all brides were from the British Isles. The majority, in fact, were Newfoundland girls. Gus's wife, Nita, comes from Grand Falls. But we were really happy. We didn't, we didn't have very much, not really. But we were happy and we were never bored. Like people will say today, you know, they're so easily bored. But we could always find something to do. They gave us a horse and a plow and six sacks of fertilizer and told us to make a living. And we had to make a living on that alone. We had to survive. So most of the fellas, a lot of fellas went cutting pulp wood and whatever, you know, and done so much pulp wood and make sure they put it in the crop, they cut more pulp wood and they kept going, you know. And they done a very good job there. And they kept her going. And you liked it here? Oh my God, the only thing, the flies I always thought they were, they were bad. Yeah. <laughs> they're still bad. They're still bad, they're no better. <laughs> I believe we're getting sassier. <laughs> <laughs> Not all war brides were happy in their new home. Many returned. For Mrs. Maura Cullahall, who grew up on a farm in Wales, this place, though, held no terror. She was accustomed to livestock and farm life. Yet Cormac was quite different from Wales. Well, there's no roads in them days uh, to Bond Bay. And from Rocky Harbor, we went across by boat. Then we had to go get to the hospital to Bond Bay. We had to go by a... Uh, dog's team or something, you know. Yeah. Oh, you had to come oh. by dog team? Oh, yeah, we, they had dog's team, you know, and horses. Oh, yeah, no, no vehicles. I don't remember no vehicles around there. <laughs> the winter weather was a bit of a shock to many war brides, yet others didn't mind it. Mrs. Ellen Crocker of the County Mayo in Ireland, for instance, was well accustomed to rural life. Oh, no, I grew up on a farm at home in Ireland. We grew our own sugar and flour, wheat, you know, and uh, sugar beet and everything like that, and brought it to the factory in Bellina and put it into flour and that. Did you miss the old country? Oh, yes, very much, uh, at the beginning but you get used to it. And then, of course, I reared my family. They were all born here in Newfoundland. Did you grow to like this place? Oh, yes, very much, yeah. You must be proud to look back at what you all accomplished here. Oh, yes, yeah. I never regret a minute of moving from Ireland to here, to Newfoundland. These are the faces of the Cormac veterans and their wives, taken just 12 years ago. Many of them are gone now. Some probably didn't think of themselves as pioneers. Creating farms from the wilderness was no big deal. But others were proud of what they'd accomplished and wanted their story told. Mrs. Alice Hewitt thought of herself as a pioneer. Oh, definitely we were pioneers. You couldn't say that we weren't. Because, I mean, the biggest part of Cormac was just a virgin forest. It was just like parachuting us down into this farming settlement and then tell us, now you go and... It was something like, uh, you know, in the olden days, you know, like they went trekked across Canada and the States. I came with one returning to this land he called his own. Lovely, lonely Newfoundland, you're now my island home. I have seen your dim blue hills kiss the evening sky. Watch your sparkling lakes grow angry with the fury from on high. As I wake upon a morning 
and you're all a shimmering white lovely lonely new found land each day i love you more for i came with one returning to this land he called his own lovely lonely new found land you're now my island home lovely lonely new found land no more this day i'll tell lovely lonely new found land let me rest beneath your soil lovely lonely new found land my own my island home It's been exactly 50 years since Mrs. Hewitt and the others came to Cormac. And the tradition continues, the clearing, the planting, the weeding, the harvesting. It's quite a legacy inherited by the sons and daughters and now the grandchildren of the pioneers. And so on Armistice Day, a tip of the hat to the soldiers, the sailors, the airmen and their wives, the pioneers of Cormac, who came from a war to a wilderness who hammered their swords into plowshares. Cormac is one of Newfoundland's few farming communities. It sits on some of the best farmland in the province on the west coast. Most settlements in Newfoundland and Labrador have grown up on their own over decades or centuries. But Cormac was created by the government, and the settlers were soldiers. When the Second World War ended, many Newfoundland soldiers and sailors weren't sure what they were coming home to. Jobs had been hard to come by before the war, and it looked just as bad now the war was over. Albert Hillier's house was one of the first in Cormac. He and his wife, Rachel, came here from Point of Gaul on the Bjorn Peninsula. When I went away overseas in 1940, there were about 75 families in Point of Gaul. When I came back, there was only about 25. There was no work. There's no the fishery there failed. Was no, no future there. The Commission of Government had been working on several projects to find jobs for veterans, and one of them was starting a farming community. Clarence Badcock worked on the project for the Commission of Government. The Cormac uh, was uh, chosen uh, for the quality of its uh, soil and the extent of the area, so that uh, it had a, uh, an excellent beginning. Forty veterans took up the offer of a house and 50 acres of land, but it was by no means ready for farming. But they had a home which was down amongst the trees, and so they had to build even a pathway to their home, so to speak, you know. Everything around them was raw and, and undeveloped. We had bad winter. The first winter was a bad winter, snow and cold. What was it like in the house? We had a stove out in the kitchen. That was it. When they went out in the night, there was no more eating till the next morning. morning the wash stand would be frozen the water in the wash pan. We didn't have a bathroom mm. then, of course and the ice around. You had anything left to bread to be frozen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, we're real pioneers. The community was named after William Epps Cormac, the pioneer who was the first man to walk across the island. 
Back in the early days of Cormac, acres of virgin forest separated most neighbors, and there was no electricity until 1964. Alice Hewitt has all the modern conveniences today. She shares memories with a younger neighbor about her culture shock when she moved here as a war bride from Edinburgh, Scotland. We were going to learn to farm, and I was going to learn to try. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we, oh, I learned to milk the cow and learned to drive the tractors and. Uh, you really had to chip in at everything and be yeah, the right, right hand for yes. the names. Or did well, you, did you ever feel like just packing it in and saying, "Why am I doing this?" Well, not exactly. My the worst time I was was uh, at Christmas and New Year. Oh, didn't I want to go home? Oh, every year I want. I don't believe I was fit to live with. To <laughs> truthfully speaking. I was so homesick. When the bell rings outside Gus Roberts' house these days, it's Pat Roberts calling her husband in from his vegetable garden. But back in the early days, Gus Roberts' spare bedroom doubled as the town's school. It all started when he met the superintendent of education on the ferry out to Woody Point. I asked him, could he get me eight desks for blackboard and stove? We had eight children up there to go to school. So I stayed home Christmas, and when I came back, station agent in Deer Lake phoned me and said I had the eight desks was there and the blackboard and the stove for Gus Roberts for the school in Carmack. <laughs> but as the children grew up and finished school, there was a new problem for Cormac. Part of the settlement agreement said that the veterans who moved here couldn't break up the land that was granted to them. That was meant to encourage farming. And it did, but it did nothing to encourage the growth of Cormac. As the settlers' children grew up, they realized they couldn't build houses of their own here because their parents weren't allowed to give them any land. It took a change in the community plan just less than 10 years ago to change all that. But the regulations are still more strict than in most towns. The son and daughter clause allows for the subdivision of a grant for a son or daughter who is first of legal age to build. So in other words, you can't subdivide for small children that they may want the land and then sell off the farm and keep that land for them. It must be done on an as-need basis. That change has meant that Cormac can continue to grow. It's easier than it was 40 years ago when a few veterans found themselves in the middle of nowhere and carved out a community for themselves. I'm Susan Newhook.